Ok, so the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard trial is now into its final week and we should shortly be getting a verdict. Since our last video on the cross-examination, we've had several of Amber's witnesses come forward and testify to what they say happened between the pair. We've also had a number of high-level Hollywood executives arguing of whether Amber's career was affected or not by this entire thing. As always, we're going to be breaking down what was said and going over the main points of each day whilst also playing relevant video clips of the highlights. Now, Amber's side was always going to be bad for Johnny Depp, but I'm still not sure whether she's really done enough to prove things in her favour. Many people keep forgetting that this is a defamation case and that Johnny is basically trying to show that his career, livelihood and reputation were affected by the op-ed, which his agent, Hollywood executives and many witnesses have backed up. Though there's a lot of really dark things being said in the trial, that is ultimately what the decision will be over and Heard's team are firstly trying to justify that the op-ed was truthful whilst also saying that it wasn't about Johnny. Heard is denied at several points the op-ed was about him but she's also using the strategy of accusing him of doing what was in it in order to basically cover the most ground against Depp. He is currently suing Amber for $50 million and on the opposite side of this, Amber is countersuing for $100 million, stating that she has lost that amount of potential earnings due to everything surrounding their relationship. Now, whether you think that's an accurate figure to put next to her career is another point entirely, but yesterday Johnny's team put forward the notion that her counterclaim should be rejected and that she should in fact be suing Adam Waldman. He stated that her entire story was fabricated in a Daily Mail interview, which apparently opened the floodgates of public opinion turning against her. Now, the judge rejected this idea and at the moment, everything still stands in place. You might remember that a couple of weeks ago, Amber's team attempted to have Johnny's case thrown out as well and I think that both legal sides were probably just exhausting the options they had in order to see if they could get a win in some way or another. When I last reported on this story, a lawyer actually reached out to me and said it's a standard procedure for this to happen and that 99.9% .9 of these kinds of actions are rejected by the judge. Now with Amber's counterclaim comes the idea that she basically had a bright career ahead of her that was snuffed out. You might have seen reports detailing how Heard's role in Aquaman 2 was massively cut down and we even got some major spoilers on the movie this week without a bloody spoiler warning. We also had the DC film president talk about why they were contemplating recasting her anyway, which I'll play after this first witness so you can kind of see one statement and then the other. Now Catherine Arnold was brought forth as an amber witness to talk about this and the apparent Hollywood expert detailed Depp's career decline and also her opinion on why Heard was about to be the next big thing. The first clip I'm going to play revolves around why she thinks Depp's career went downhill for reasons other than the op-ed and then we'll go into why she thinks Amber Heard lost out on $50 million. Based on your analysis, what has caused Mr. Depp's career downturn? And I realize you've said a number of those, so just is there anything else? <laughs> sure. Uh, well, we've talked about the erratic behavior, the tardiness, the drugs and alcohol abuse and the lawsuits have had a really big impact, not just this lawsuit, but previous lawsuits that Mr. Depp has been involved with because there's a lot of publicity around anything that he does. And uh, every time he has filed a lawsuit, it has brought to light various issues with respect to whatever that lawsuit was about, whether it was about, you know, erratic behavior or domestic abuse or drugs and alcohol and even spending habits. So every time a lawsuit has been filed, the press and the publicity has just been charged up and brought everything back to light. And it's, it, it's been an unfortunate problem for, for on, on that level for the industry to continue to work with him, even though all this is out in the, in the public. Okay, so Catherine basically talking there about how it was Johnny taking people to court that caused his career to drop, which I don't really agree with. And in all honesty, I think the op-ed and photos that Amber put out made it difficult to hire him again. This is something Hollywood executive Richard Marks discussed and he went over how there was basically a no tolerance policy on any accusations after the Me Too movement, which we did detail in our other videos. I'm going to play two more clips of Catherine's statement and then we'll go over Richard Marks' assessment of it and why he thinks this is completely off the mark. Did Amber have a contract for Aquaman 1? Yes. How much was she paid for Aquaman 1? Aquaman 1, she was paid $2 million. And did that same contract uh, provide for if she was in Aquaman 2? I'm sorry, I apologize. Aquaman 1, I believe she got $1 million. Aquaman 2, she was supposed to get $2 million. I apologize, the numbers, there were a lot of numbers in that one contract. So Aquaman 1, it was $1 million. Aquaman 2, it was going to be $2 million. All right. Now, based on your experience uh, and knowledge in the industry, 
how much would Amber Heard have been able to negotiate uh, her contract but for the Depp Waldman statements? For Aquaman 2, I'm asking. Right. Well, as you can see from Mr. Momo's contract that went up exponentially, up to $15 million. Uh, Ms. Heard, I don't know if she would have gotten $15 million for the movie, but she certainly could have increased it by one or $2 million or even doubled it. So if it was two, it could have been four or even five or six, depending on the enthusiasm if it had just rolled from Aquaman 1 to Aquaman 2 without any of this negativity that was created by the, Waldman, the Deb Waldman statements. What happened with these other actors after they had their Stars oh, unrelated to Q scores. Were, right, right, right. Oh, okay, sorry. So all those actors' careers, the ones I mentioned, they all either were a steady rise or even a meteoric rise in, in terms of where their career went after their Star is Born moment. Then they got some other good films, and maybe they got another film that performed extremely well. So it was a range, but they all were on an upward trajectory without a doubt. And what does this mean for Amber? With a reason, I mean, the way that the... The, the kind of industry works is usually, unless there is an, a force majeure or some really negative event, her career should have followed that same upward swing in, in about the same time frame, it, give or take six months to a year, but you, it would be very reasonable to, to believe that her career would have been on an upward trajectory within the range of those other actors. So over the course of five years, it's very reasonable to consider that she would have been in at least one film a year at a minimum of $4 million because that's what her precedent would have been had she renegotiated. And it's important to note that in her, in her Justice League contract, had there, if there is a Aquaman 3, her price is set at $4 million. So it's very reasonable to assume and to believe that if she did a film a year for five years at a minimum of $4 million a year without any negotiation, which probably would have happened, but let's just say that baseline, that would be another $20 million over that time frame. So combining all of these opinions and calculations that you've had, what, if any, range are the losses you are estimating for Amber Heard but for the Depp Waldman statements? Right, so again, it's really important that, that I looked at, and, and hopefully you understand this, that it's over time, right? So let's just say a minimum of five years that we're gonna talk about these losses, and it could be more, but at minimum, if you look at the film, the television, and the endorsement contracts, it's very likely that Ms. Heard should have earned between 45 and $50 million over that time period. So Catherine basically outlining there why she thinks Amber would have got that much money. However, she also slipped up quite a lot and showed that she probably wasn't as clued in as she thought she was. Catherine didn't know Robert Pattinson was the current Batman, and she also failed to take into account the fact that Warner Brothers don't always up contracts, which was seen in Fantastic Beasts. There's also actors who don't necessarily get brought across in the sequels, like Terrence Howard with Iron Man, and once we get into Walter Hamada's statement, it will show why her return wasn't necessarily a guarantee. I wasn't looking to give her the same career as Jason Momoa. I took her numbers that her agents had, had actually negotiated and worked from there. When you say you weren't trying to give her the same career as Jason Momoa, the, the TV program that she most recently did, The Stand, she made 200000 an episode. That's what you testified to. Correct. And in your damage analysis, you give her a million dollars an episode had the Waldman statements not occurred. And you do it only because you believe Mr. Momoa has gotten that in, in, in something that he's in. Right. So you are giving her the same career as Jason Momoa. Well, again, with someone like uh, Ms. Hurd, who was in a blockbuster film with a team at William Morris, in my discussions with William Morris, that's what they were looking to negotiate for her on other projects. So I got some of that information from her. So the formula and logic kind of falls down there under scrutiny, and this was further hammered home by Richard Marx. For some context to this, Heard was compared to the big A-listers that start off this question. I have got bits out of this as there's several objections from Amber's side, but the questions just get answered anyway, so I'm saving you three minutes of them just arguing that Marx shouldn't be allowed to answer that before it's eventually overruled. Do you understand that Ms. Arnold um, compares Ms. Hurd's career trajectory with that of other actors, including Jason Momoa, Gal Gadot, Zendaya, Ana de Armas, and Chris Pine? I heard that. And what's your opinion of those actors um, as comparables for Ms. Hurd? 
Uh, again, uh, they are not comparable. Jason Momoa was Aquaman. Uh, Chris Pine was Captain Kirk. Gal Gadot was Wonder Woman. Zendaya has been working on Disney Channel since she was 13. Uh, she's in all the Spider-Man movies. She goes by one name. Uh, Anna de Armas, uh, you know, when she was in uh, a movie uh, that they call, uh, you know, her breakout, uh, it was as a, a nude poster. She's been an ensemble piece, Knives Out. These are not comparables. Now, Ms. Arnold stuck to Jason Momoa, who's the most non-comparable because of his history and his career, but she didn't give us the advantage of, of telling us what his contracts were, what he renegotiated to, what he earned. She didn't give us any of those building blocks. She just created, she set him up as a comparable and then said what Miss Heard should earn, but she never gave us the salary of Jason Momoa or the other comparables. And uh, she built like this house of cards on nothing. Uh, you know, she showed us the, the, with her words, the beautiful clothing that the emperor was wearing. But, but we could see, if you know the business... Yeah, objection, Your Honor. That he wasn't. Be honest. You were just speaking about uh, Mr. Momoa as a comparable. Are you aware that um, Ms. Arnold compares uh, Ms. Heard to uh, Mr. Momoa as an actor with equivalent franchise experience who was able to renegotiate his salary for significant increases in bonus? Yes. What's your response to that opinion? Again, he didn't have comparable uh, franchise experience to, to Ms. Heard. He was Conan the Bar Barbarian. He played Aquaman in a movie that Amber Heard was not in. He played Aquaman, not a supporting character like Mira. It's just not comparable. Um, and you can say the words, but, but I saw nothing from Miss Arnold to back it up, something to build on, which if she was a negotiator in the trench, uh, the, the studio negotiator would say, okay, so show us, you know, where's the comps? Let's talk numbers, because ultimately that's where we have to get to, not just because you say it so, we just don't believe you, you've got to show us. So yeah, pretty much shut down what Arnold was saying, and it kind of derailed the $50 million valuation. Marx also brought up the fact that salaries are factored into the budget of a movie as well. So for example, if Aquaman 5 is going to cost $200 million, if Jason Momoa at that point is getting a salary of $40 million, then they're not also going to have $20 million spare to give to Amber because the movie isn't going to have that budget. I'm not going to spoil Aquaman 2, even though that's, that's probably on brand for me, but there were major plot points given on the movie during the testimonies, and Mira basically is going to show up at the start, be taken out of the plot for the majority of it, and then show up at the end. Her role is really diminished, so these valuations go out the window quite a bit. Now you could blame this all in the drama going on, but Walter Hamada gave a testimony that shut down the idea that she was as sought after as Arnold believed. Hamada goes over why they were actually talking about recasting Mira after the first movie because her and Momoa didn't have any chemistry. He also goes over her contract with the studio and the workings of DC in general. I'm going to cut between the two pieces and also shout out Asman Gold for his reaction during this first moment. At any point in time from the beginning of history to today, did Warner Brothers rehire Ms. Heard for Aquaman 2? No, because we just picked up her option. Did Ms. Heard receive a pay increase for Aquaman 2? No. Was her role ever reduced for any reason? Um, no, I mean, again, from the early stages of the development of the All script, right. uh, the movie was built around yep. uh, the character Damn. of Arthur and the character of Orm, Arthur being Jason Momoa and Orm being Patrick Wilson. Uh -huh. um, so they were always the two co-leads of the movie. Well, okay. for compensation for Aquaman 2 affected in any way by anything said by Johnny Depp? No. Was there any delay... Uh yeah. In Warner Brothers exercising the option to cast Miss Heard in Aquaman 2. 
Uh, yes, there was. Uh, there were conversations about potentially recasting. Who was the producer? Uh, Peter Saffron. <laughs> what, if any, creative concerns did Warner Brothers have about casting Amber Heard as Mira in Aquaman 2? Good question. What is the concerns that were brought up uh, at the wrap of the first movie? production of the first movie, which is the issue of chemistry. Did the two have chemistry? Um, you know, I think editorially they were able to, to make that relationship work in the first movie, but there was a concern that it took a lot of effort to get there, and would we be better off recasting, finding someone who had better, more natural chemistry with Jason Momoa uh, and move forward that way? This is the guy that, Warner Brothers, that runs uh, it. Did you speak at all with Jason Momoa? in preparation for your uh, deposition today? No. Have you ever spoken with Jason Momoa about any issues relating to chemistry between he and Amber Heard? Um, yes. When did you speak with Jason Momoa about chemistry issues between he and Amber Heard? It would have been in that same time period where we were prior to green light of the movie. Now, you were asked some questions about scripts. Uh, did you review any of the drafts of the script for Aquaman 2? Yes. When? I, I, part of my role is I read all the drafts of the scripts as they come in. When was the first script for Aquaman 2? Oh, okay. boy. I cannot tell you. Probably in 2018, the latter part of 2018 would be my guess. And how many versions of the script had been written by the beginning of 2021 for Aquaman 2? Oh, there, there were probably half dozen drafts of the script. All right. What, if anything, did Rob Cowan say to you about chemistry? What specifically about the chemistry between Amber Heard and Jason Momoa? just the the fact that they didn't really have a lot of chemistry together um you know the, the reality is it's not uncommon on movies for for two leads to not have chemistry and that it's sort of movie magic and editorial the ability to sort of put performances together and with the magic of you know a great score and and how you put the pieces together you can you can fabricate sort of that chemistry um and so i think in in at the end of the day, I think if you watch the movie, they look like they had great chemistry. But I just know that through the course of the post-production that it took a lot of effort to get there. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes it's very easy. You just put the you know characters on the screen together and they work. And sometimes it's harder. And more specifically, did you play any role in the determination to communicate to Amber's representatives that Warner Brothers was considering not exercising her option? Um, yeah, probably in the sense of we had the conversations, and I believe, if I recall, we had, uh, that's where Peter Safran offered to reach out to the agent uh, and express where, which direction we were leaning. So yeah, the defamation claim by Heard seems to be unfounded when the president of DC Films was saying there was talks of recasting her and that she had a reduced role in the second film, which is basically going to be a brother comedy team up. There's a lot of conspiracy theories going around about it at the moment, saying that he's lying to save face and that they reduced her role because of the trial, but remember, this is under oath. Now, speaking of being under oath, there's also talk of Heard being investigated for perjury after telling the UK High Court that she gave her divorce settlement to charity. During the libel case with the son, Amber stated that she had donated the full amount. However, we now know that this was just pledged and that it hasn't been paid across. Going to be interesting to see how this develops, and Heard's witnesses appear through video deposition throughout the week. There's not really that many highlights, and most tend to corroborate the same stories that they witnessed bruising on Amber, and also Heard arguments between the pair. Whitney, Amber's sister, was also brought into this, and she discussed the Australia incident. I've had numerous issues with YouTube posting clips about that specific thing, so I think the best thing to do is just talk about it, rather than playing the testimony. Whitney said that Johnny struck Amber, and that he was verbally abusive to her when he was intoxicated. This did counter the security guard's testimony, who said that only Amber was the one that attacked, so it's very much going to come down to the jury to decide what they believe. It's been argued that because the security guard Travis was employed by Depp that he's biased, but you could also say that because Whitney is Amber's sister, that she is too. 
Now, Jennifer Howell also ended up dropping quite a big bombshell in court and she actually went over Whitney's statement. Turns out that she'd emailed her and asked her to come clean about her sister. She testified under oath that Amber had lied about the entire thing and the donations and that she wasn't doing this to side with Johnny just to free Whitney from her sister's control. This is something that has often been levied against her and to have this come out was a major blow to her side. Why did you send this email and letter to Miss Enriquez? Because I struggled very much with what to do in a situation that I love someone who I know is doing something very wrong and I know that they're doing it because they're trying to protect their sister and I'm trying to protect her and I'm just trying to get her to wake up and do the right thing which is tell the truth it's the only thing that can help everybody involved in this case. The whole thing was pretty damning and to hear it from someone who's meant to be quite impartial was a massive blow for Amber's team. Now Kate Moss is also someone that is now a major player in all of this. If you cast your mind back to Amber's testimony then you might recall that she brought up Kate Moss and discussed the incident in which she'd heard that she'd been pushed down the stairs. This was a big moment in which Depp's team celebrated and it massively rocked the case. Moss was originally not allowed to be a witness because she was judged as being irrelevant to the entire thing. However, because Amber brought her up during her testimony, this allowed Depp's team to call her to the stand. Amber initially used Kate Moss as a way to show he had been abusive to other partners. However, today Moss tore this open and denied all of these rumors. Good afternoon, your, t- your time. Uh, my name is Ben Chu from the firm of uh, Brown Rudnick. Uh, would you please state your full name for the record? Kate Moss. Ms. Moss, where do you reside? London, England. From where are you testifying today, Ms. Moss? Um, Gloucestershire, England. Ms. Moss, do you know Johnny Depp? Yes, I do. How do you know Mr. Depp? I had a relationship with him. Uh, Did there come a time when you and Mr. Depp had a romantic relationship? Yes. For how long, Ms. Moss, were you and Mr. Depp a romantic couple? From 1993 to, no, 1994 to 1998. Miss Moss, did there come a time when you, uh, while you and Mr. Depp were a couple, that the two of you took a vacation together to the Golden Eye Resort in Jamaica? Yes. What, if anything, happened when you were in Jamaica with Mr. Depp? I, um, we were leaving the room and Johnny left the room before I did and there had been a rainstorm and as I left the room I slid down the stairs and I hurt my back. How did you, and, uh, I apologize Miss Moss, please continue. And I screamed because I was in, because uh, I didn't know what had happened to me and I was in pain and um, he came running back to help me and carried me to my room and got me medical attention. Did Mr. Depp push you in any way down the stairs? No. Uh, during the course of your relationship, did he ever push you down any stairs? No, he never pushed me, kicked me, or threw me down any stairs. Ms. Moss, have you ever before today testified in any kind of court proceeding? No, I have never. Why did you decide to testify today? Objection, Your Honor. All right. That's beyond the scope of what we just talked about. All right, I'll sustain the objection. Thank you, Ms. Moss. Uh, We have nothing further at this time. We greatly appreciate your taking the time to testify. All right. Any cross examination? No, Your Honor. All right. You're free to go. Thank you, Ms. Moss. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Your next witness. It was crushing to Heard's testimony and acted as a great character witness to Johnny, which, coupled with the other witness statements, really helped his case. Kate Moss is something that Amber tried to weaponize to make Johnny look bad but it backfired on her massively and will likely make people wonder what else she's making up. 
Now, we also had Dr. David Spiegel, who diagnosed Depp as a narcissist without having ever met him and only from hearing secondhand accounts. His company said that you shouldn't do this and then he did it, which was brought up in the cross-examination. He got really argumentative and had to be asked by the judge to calm down, which made him come across as a really bad witness. The internet's pretty much been going wild, calling him Doc Brown from Back to the Future and uh, uh, no comment on if that's a fair comparison. Now I've cut this down a fair bit because they just go over stuff about ethics of his testimony for about eight minutes and it just goes in circles. So I've saved you that one as well. The rule, in fact, contemplates that issue, doesn't it, sir? The, again, I'm just telling you the answer to the question. When you're reading me those statements, I'm telling you the response by the other side who has publishes also is that if that was the case, there could be no expert witness testimony in the courtroom. Psychiatrists are ethically prohibited from evaluating individuals without, permi without permission or other authorization such as a court order. That's the rule, right? Again, if you're reading that, then I have to believe you're not misrepresenting it. And I would come back to you again, then this whole thing on effort, we might as well get rid of all the expert witnesses we've had throughout all of time for court proceedings. Because what you're saying is unless a court orders it, and that's what you just said, or the APA said, then therefore expert witnesses cannot do an evaluation based on an observation of the medical records. Insurance companies cannot do evaluations solely based on the medical records where there are doctors rendering professional opinions. So at the end of the day, you are essentially saying that unless someone has directly evaluated it, there, this whole medical system we have, this whole legal system we have, is null and void. I, I, I'm not saying. No, yes, you are, sir. I, no, you are. Well, give me a give me a second, and I'll, okay. I'll give you more than a second. What what I'm saying and what I am reading to you is a rule by your organization that takes into account that there could be court orders that would permit the, the exact kind of evaluation that you say I'm eliminating. And I, I think we're going in circles because I think I just said that means expert witness testimony would not be allowed and the branch of forensic psychiatry would be especially hindered and we know the branch of forensic psychiatry does not prohibit that. So. I am a member of the APA. That doesn't necessarily mean every single thing they put in there, everybody has to uncategorically agree with, because clearly that's not the case. Let's start with the easy question then. Maybe we can- That was pretty easy, go ahead. All right, yeah. Doctor, you're gonna have to just answer the questions. Okay, okay. sorry about that. I haven't yeah. been getting into it. You, you need to just answer the questions, okay. Dr. Speaker. You are not rendering any diagnosis whatsoever of Mr. Depp today or ever. No, I probably would say to you that, certainly I would not say narcissistic personalities, or I would say traits. Certainly from what I have read, intimate partner violence is not a diagnosis. So the answer is no right. for that. Uh, narcissistic personality traits is not a diagnosis, the answer is no. But if you want to tell me that substance use disorder is a psychiatric diagnosis? The answer is yes, and I. But that wasn't an issue, was it? Whether Mr. Uh, Mr. Depp used substances. I mean, you said you've gone through the record. That that wasn't really an issue at this trial. He said it from day one. Oh, so you're saying he's already admitted to the diagnosis? He's Sorry. already admitted to the use of the substances. Oh. Well, again. There's a difference between admitting to substance use and substance use disorder. Let's go back to uh, what you just said about narcissistic personality traits. Yes. Narcissistic personality disorder is a DSM-5 diagnosis, correct? Correct. Diagnos diagnostic personality, and you haven't testified that Mr. Depp has um, narcissistic personality disorder, have you? I would certainly, if I didn't, I'm certainly thinking that, but at least I'm going to say he has traits, which are characteristics of provisional diagnosis of, it's a provisional diagnosis of probably narcissistic personality disorder, but yeah, I mean, I do believe that. Now from here, he also talked about Depp's behavior on set from what he'd been told. There's been testimony around the, around that picture that 
Mr. Depp fell asleep with ice cream in his hand. That's not vomitous, right? I, I was told it was vomitous. Okay. Um, you talked about the fact that Mr. Depp uh, indicates that from time to time he uses an earpiece. I was, yeah, I mean, I, I read that, yes. Okay. Um, did you read the testimony of Mr. Wyatt, who told you what was being pumped into that earpiece? Yeah. I mean, if I, if I remember right, I mean, it was, I think it was lines, right? No, it was music. It was music? Not his lines? Yeah. Okay. So if, if Mr. Depp was listening to music rather than being fed his lines, does that change your opinion as to his cognitive function? If he was never fed his lines through the earpiece, which I know he was, but read he was, and that may have been that example, Mr. Wyatt may have said that it was music. I guess the question is, were you having the music during the, during the actual talking of your lines? Is that what you're saying to me? Well, you know, if, if you can do two things at once, that's a pretty high cognitive function, isn't it, sir? You know, it's a very good point, actually. Divided attention is something humans have a lot of trouble in. So, for instance, we have trouble driving and putting on the, you know, using our uh, cell phones and direct. So, divided attention, humans actually are not very good at. I'll, I'll yeah. put that out there. But Mr. In general, not but, just Mr. Depp in general. But, but Mr. Depp is pretty good at acting. You, you, you acknowledge that early on. Absolutely. Well, better than me, so I know that. Because you don't act. In fact, you don't know about acting. You're right. I have no okay. idea about acting. And you don't know how prevalent the use of earpieces are in acting. Again, I, do, I, I know nothing about acting. Irrespective of the fact you know nothing about acting, you've testified that Mr. Depp's use of an earpiece is somehow a cognitive deficit? So if I was giving a lecture and I was fed my lines, I would think there's a cognitive deficit. So I'm, and maybe I'm wrong. Like I said, maybe I could be wrong. Maybe Hollywood stars get lines fed to them through earpieces all the time, and I, I don't know. I, I, that could be said. It sounded to me to be unusual if you're doing a movie and you don't know the lines. But like you said, I'm just judging into what I do with lectures, and I, that would never happen. If you gave lectures, you wouldn't use an earpiece, but you, you're not going to tell anybody how to act. I'm sorry, what was the question? I, I said if you gave lectures, you wouldn't use an earpiece, but you're not telling anybody how to act. Right. I would not use an earpiece during lectures. Right. But I, again, I don't know what the standard for a care of how standard is Hollywood is for that. I have no idea. Your use, uh, your testimony about the use of an earpiece as um, maybe you were wrong. You're comfortable with the fact that you may have made a mistake there? No, because I think in the basis of what I've read about it, I'm comfortable that I, I don't believe that actors are routinely given their entire script through earpieces. I find that hard to believe. Yeah, but, and, and but not one whit of evidence that ever, this ever happened I, here. I guess what I said, I just said, I find it hard to believe. I didn't say it, ha I said I find it hard to believe. That's all I said. Oh, yeah, but what you found hard to believe, sir, was that every, every line of the script was, was pumped through an earpiece. Where did you ever get the idea that ever that occurred? That's what I have been, that's what I read in the uh, court review, the court evidence. That's where I got it from. Right, right. And, um, you know where, whether Marlon Brando used an earpiece? Whether, isn't he dead? <laughs> yeah. So the answer is no, he does not use one now. Oh, no, I, I, I used the past tense. So. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, again, I know nothing, I will concede to you, I know nothing about acting. I will concede to you 100%. If that is the standard and people are done that acting, then I apologize and that was wrong on my part. If that's the standard, I'm wrong. I don't know. Okay. Let's go with that. No further questions. All right. How long? So, yeah, kind of, uh, you know, I am trying to stay as unbiased as possible. But from my point of view, these witnesses didn't really help the case that much. And at points, I was thinking they did more damage than good. Kind of got me thinking, is this the best that Amber's team has, as there were so many of her so-called experts that didn't really hold up under scrutiny. Now Johnny did have bad days and good days, but I don't think that was really enough given to make me think that 
he hadn't lost out on roles because of the op-ed, which I do personally believe was about him, even with the denials from Hurd's side. Whether they can fully prove it is another matter, but going beyond a reasonable doubt, I think that most people would agree that it did cost him jobs, and after hearing the cross this week, I'm not sure if Amber actually lost out on things because of the reports about her. I have to keep telling people this is a defamation case, and though the more extreme things coming out about it grab the headlines, at the crux of it, that is what the jury have to decide, and to me, Johnny has come out looking a lot better than Amber has, and I think his side have argued the points way better than hers have. Could be wrong, but of course, let me know below what you think after hearing the highlights. This trial is drawing to a close, and I will try and do a follow up on it at some point, so make sure you stay locked to the channel. On screen now, we have a link to our other videos, so definitely go and check them out right after this. Without the way, thanks for sticking through this one. Take care, peace.